All right. So, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name's Roland. I go by Raj or RJ. Names, but a name. Um, I'm the owner and educator at the Witch and the Alchemist Apothecary. Uh, my background's in the medical field. I worked in the medical field for over 11 years with the Sante, Providence, also uh, other health systems in other states. Um, I've worked in different departments and specialties over the years. I also was a caregiver for my from a lot of um, multiple family members of mine, and some of them all the way until their end uh, end of life cycle. I uh, over the years I, I came to realize that allopathic uh, medicine was mainly kind of geared more towards uh, more of treating the symptoms, but never really treating the person as a whole. And that's what kind of um, inspired me to. Um, to look into alternative medicine and I observed the Eastern medicine uh, modalities or they addressed uh, the person with a more holistic uh, approach and concerned more so with the mind, the body and the soul. And so with that it inspired me to open up my own apothecary and uh, you know share the information and knowledge and ultimately uh, give back to the community and, and present that you know as much knowledge as I can and just make it available. Uh, you know, I want to help others, uh, whether it be family, uh, you know, families with loved ones that are ill, or those just wanting to have a holistic approach of well-being, uh, to well-being. Anyways, I like, like I said, I love sharing knowledge. Hello. Hello. And uh, I hope it ignites some the same passion within you, and then you pay it forward, and and, and you know, go out there and, and you know, share this information with others. Um, like I said, it's ultimately to spread knowledge to the community and spark interest. And if everybody knew how to remedy a cold without having to, uh, you know, lean so heavy on pharmaceuticals, or if you know, we connected more with nature and embrace the her healing, you know, beauty and, and and all she has to offer there, I believe we can all kind of heal collectively if we all kind of got together and and did that. You know, uh, I really do. Uh, I really did want to exp would like to explore like all the medicinal properties of these plants and kind of go in depth. Uh, however, I did want to also make it uh, to where it was easy to digest and kind of a quick little um, bit of information. So um, that so that way everybody was kind of can kind of find some interest in it. I uh, will be diving more into a class actually um, this winter kind of going over a lot more of the, the medicinal properties of some of the plants that I'm uh, showing tonight. Uh, and that, you know, they'll, a little bit of their medicinal properties, their history, and, and kind of so forth. So um, if anybody wants to get with me afterwards, we can talk, you know, uh, after uh, the presentation here. So uh, I do want to put it out there that there is a disclaimer, um, you know, obviously for legal reasons and you know, CYA, uh, you just want to make sure that, you know, you're exploring responsibly. You know, there's plenty to see off on the roadsides and, you know, busy streets or busy places um, that may not be that favorable to pull off to and not safe. So I do assure you, though, that there's plenty of places that I've explored. Come on in. Hi. And uh, that I've explored that are safer to find these, these plants in location, I mean, uh, and, and kind of... Uh, you know, find the plants there, sorry. Uh, although, although it is mentioned that some of these plants are edible, it is your responsibility to do your research. Uh, parks, city limits, uh, country roadsides, most of these places uh, spray with pesticides or herbicides. And so, you know, I would really hate for anybody to, you know, take the information from here and then go and try something that, you know, is laced with chemicals and so. Uh, so yeah, so uh, just be be mindful of that. Um, I, I got to say that I'm not a physician, nor am I giving medical advice or diagnosing uh, to diagnose, treat, cure any disease or ailment. Uh, all knowledge shared here is solely for educational purposes. And some of these uh, plants that are referenced here, uh, you know, if you're going to consume them, just uh, I would say consult your doctor. Uh, some of these plants do have contraindications with medications, and so you want to make sure that you're not, um, you know, you just want to make sure that you're safe if, if you are taking like blood pressure medications or antidepressants or anything like that. So, 
Uh, and then just ethically forging, it's not really a disclaimer, but just making sure that you are mindful. Um, sometimes you don't have to harvest an entire plant. You can take just a little bit and leave the rest so others can enjoy it. Uh, you know, um, the other thing with that is that being mindful of like when you're harvesting because certain plants, you know, during their seeding uh, time, you know, you don't want to clip the, the next generation off and take it home with you. You want to make sure that there's enough for, for everybody and it keeps going. So, um, all right, so there's two terms that I'm going to use, uh, and it's indigenous plants and postmodern indigenous, which I don't know if that's the actual word, but I, it kind of fits the bill. So basically, indigenous plants are the plants that are natural to the land. And then postmodern indigenous are the plants that are either have been brought here for cultivation or you know, have trekked in here somehow and then have planted roots and now are pretty much modern day, uh, this is their home in Oregon. So, uh, okay. Now, I'm gonna jump right into it. Uh, so, I did, like I said, I, I put a little bit of thought into how I was gonna present this and how it was going to uh, be uh, you know, enough information, but at the same time, a good format for, for me to provide that. So, um, it goes, uh, the way that the format is, it's gonna be location, season, description, and medicinal properties, and I'll probably just kinda ad-lib most of this, but I'll try to stick to it, so if you're reading it. Uh, so yeah, so the first one on, on, in regards to being indigenous to uh, Oregon is uh, wild yarrow. And uh, you can find this in pretty much valley, in the valley, uh, you know, in, in, on trails, uh, wooded areas, open fields. I've, I found it all over the place. And you can find it in urban developments. So a lot of it, it uh, a lot of places use it as like ornate, uh, you know, uh, to, to plant for landscaping. Uh, the seasons typically are between se uh, April to September. And, uh, you know, they grow about, I would say about like three feet tall. And they have like a flat topped, um, flat top, uh, like a, a dome shaped flowering, uh, which are, they're either white or like a yellowish color, uh, I found. Um, I don't know if anybody else has foraged any, but uh, yeah. So yeah. I don't know if she comes in other colors too, purple the, or? Nice, nice. I think I, I, I might have seen some purple. So uh, let's see here. And I just want to, just real quick, I just, come on in. I wanted to say thank you all for being here. Uh, and I appreciate you guys uh, showing up and wanting to hear this out. So, um, yeah, so they're a hardy perennial. Uh, they can reach about, up to about three feet tall. Uh, one of the big distinct um, characteristics is their flower, I mean their, their leaves here. They kind of look like fern, uh, fern leaves spreading out there. Um, but they're pretty easy to spot. And uh, the medicinal properties, it, it has been known to be used for, to stop bleeding of wounds and cuts. Uh, it can be used as a poultice, a poultice for uh, burns and open sores. In some cases, uh, it's been used for, uh, to cure fevers and colds uh, and alleviate toothaches. Uh, the leaves were messed up uh, with water and put into uh, put on wounds, and the indigenous uh, people of the land believe that it was acti it acted as a disinfectant or a, uh, pr and promoted he healing there. Okay, um, so we all know this plant. Everybody, I think, has seen it around. Hello. And. Uh, so this is Pacific. This is the Pacific blackberry. Uh, most of what we see around the area, though, is actually an invasive species. Uh, it's not, and I'll dive into that species in a little bit. Uh, but basically, locations uh, for Pacific blackberry it can be kind of kind of go off the beaten path to actually find them because it's uh, the invasive species actually takes over most of the areas around here. And uh, uh, the seasons for this is uh, either between you know June to August. I mean that's usually the time with September when people start picking berries around here. Yeah. Uh, they have a thorny thicket shrub, uh, which actually, interesting enough, they're part of the rose family. Um, and they produce large edible blackberries. Uh, it has been said that blackberries, uh, blackberry is used for treating diarrhea, fluid retention, diabetes, gout, and pain uh, and swelling or inflammation, and uh, for preventing cancer and heart disease. It also has been used as a, as a mouth rinse for uh, mouth, mild mouth and 
and throat irritation. Now, Oregon grape, uh, the Oregon grape, I don't know if anybody's uh, seen these around, yeah? Nice. Yeah, so uh, they can be found pretty much all over, uh, all over on trails, urban developments. Some people use them you know, as landscaping, decoration, rivers, lakes, countrysides. Um, the seasons are usually between April to early fall. In, the, in, in spring, they're usually, uh, the Oregon grape, they, they bear these clusters of bright yellow flowers in the spring and um, and they're kind of they have a light scent to them uh, and and the flowers ripen into round uh, kind of dusty blue they almost look like they resemble grapes I mean you could take a look here uh, but I do want to mention that the berries if you do try them they are edible and the seeds but they're very very bitter um, but still pretty tasty if, if that's your t you know cup of tea uh, Medicinal properties, organ grapes have been known to be used uh, for, to, for stomach ulcers, gastro, uh, GERD, stomach upset, and uh, a bitter tonic to treat infections and uh, cleanse the bowels, uh, to, to basically cleanse the bowels there. So. Do you know, I know like um, this golden seal is over harvested, the mm -hmm. bird ring that's found in the roots makes the roots like gold color. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know if that berberine is also found in the berries? I don't know if it's found in the berries, but for sure it's in the bark and then the, uh, the roots there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. you have to look that up. But it's a good question. Can you repeat the question for the audio? Oh, oh can I repeat the question? Uh, so you asked if um, berberine is found in the berry as well as the roots. As, yeah. as well as the roots. yeah. So, um, yeah, I'll just take a, take a look into some books and see if whether that's true or just Google it. No? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's high in antioxidants and vitamin C, which is good for the immune system. Not the berberine is just in the root. In the roots from the... Mm -hmm. huh. Well, it's awesome to, to see all these, like, all the people that have some knowledge in, in plants and <laughs> stuff like that. So that's why I'm, I'm glad you guys are here. Uh, so golden poppies, otherwise, well, I'm from California, so we can call California poppies. <laughs> uh, they can be found pretty much everywhere, uh, parks, roadsides, hillsides. I mean, they grow pretty, pretty wild here. Um, usually between the seasons of May or the months of May and Ju July. Uh, the description, I mean, it's basically. I mean, I don't know if anybody has not seen a yellow or a golden <laughs> poppy, but. It is just like it looks here. It's a, uh, you know, has these feathery green gray leaves, and it, they get, they have four mm -hmm. petals uh, with a golden color to them. Uh, the seeds. The cool thing about this is the reason why we see them so often or so all over the place <laughs> is because that their seeds, uh, their pods can actually when when it's time for them to <coughs> to disperse, they they can disperse it into about like a six foot radius. So. It's pretty interesting um, how, how, how these plants and how they're designed and how they thrive, you know, to, to how they're designed to, to thrive like that. So the flowers and seeds are edible. Um, they have a lot of medicinal properties. Golden poppy uh, contain, uh, well, I guess they have the, the, the medicinal properties that they have are, um, you know, they may assist with relaxation and sleepiness. Uh, other than that, they use them for. Or it can be used for anxiety, insomnia, and you know mild aches there. And uh, elderberry, blue elderberry. I think who was it that brought in the, the show and tell? I did. Uh, really? Yeah. Oh, cute. Nice. Oh. She, she's popping off on the grizzly peak. Grizzly peak. Mm -hmm. Nice. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yes, um, you know they can be found in trails, ditches, countrysides, mountaintops. Um, between the what, months of May and August, I would say, is when I'm, this is just my observation of when I found them out there. Uh, they're broadly lance-shaped, lance-shaped, smooth tooth leaflets. Uh, they have small, creamy white flowers and, and uh, flat top clusters of these little white flowers. The, you know, they are edible. Um, you know, I don't, I, I, I always cook them down. I don't eat them raw. Uh, just because you know they're not they might cause they can cause mild nausea um, and other GI issues 
Um, so the fruit can be boiled down though and, and then used for consumption. Now, medicinally, uh, elderberry has been used in folk medicine to treat colds and flus, the elderflower as well, to treat constipation, reduce cold and flu symptoms, treat gingivitis, uh, even help with controlling blood sugar. Okay, so, uh, well, I just, like I said before, uh, postmodern indigenous is the plants that um, are not native, uh, naturally, or they're not native to the land, but they're, they've been brought in to, you know, for however they got here and now they're part of our uh, scenery here in the southern uh, Oregon Valley. Uh, so Himalayan blackberries, that was the invasive species of blackberry. Um, they actually, I think it was, and you can fact check me on this, but um, it was in the 1800s uh, in Eugene they were brought in to, I think, produce a more robust berry, uh, blackberry here. Um, but basically these are pretty invasive, so you can find them all over the place. You can find them from, you know, ditches to rivers to, you know, your backyard. Some people find them a nuisance and try to get rid of them, but, um, yeah, you can find them pretty, pretty much everywhere here in the, the valley. Um, they do have a large heart-shaped leaf, uh, deep purple, black colored berries uh, when ripe. They're full of antioxidants, vitamins, and minerals found in, you know, that are found in these blackberries. Uh, deliver a variety of health benefits. Antioxidants such as anthocyanins um, hold many anti-inflammatory and antimicrobial uh, properties there. Um, lemon balm. Uh, I'm pretty sure people. Have, I don't know if you've seen that around the way here as well, but it grows. Uh, in a few different locations, I mean, it grows in a lot of different places, I mean, uh, I found it in parks, I found it by the riverside, I've found them on trails, uh, urban developments, I've seen them growing out of con concrete by the car wash, you know, they're, they're pretty, pretty invasive. Uh, and, um, you know, they, they usually come out around like April to June. Uh, they're a pretty bushy plant, you know, they maybe about like two feet tall, they grow pretty wide, uh, pretty out, they spread out, and, uh, you know, they have like a, a very, um, so any, uh, they're part of the mint family, and they have square stems, mm -hmm. so that's one distinguishing mark uh, of uh, lemon balm, or of, yeah, of, of the lemon balm, and they have like a lemony scent to them when you rub them in your hands there, I don't know if anybody has experienced that. Uh, the medicinal properties, you know, lemon balm was used traditionally, uh, in traditional medicine for nervousness, anxiety, insomnia, uh, menstrual irregulations, uh, and it's considered an, an invasive species. Mullen. Mullen, right, yeah. Cool. <laughs> it is pretty cool. Uh, I would say that I've had a pretty cool experience, and all these are pretty much uh, experiences that I've had. I mean, when I'm giving these descriptions, it's, it's just pretty much what I've gathered from the field, uh, like from working out, uh, being out there and, and foraging. So. Uh, they can be found pretty much in valley in the valley in the parks. I've seen them over uh, over there by Emigrant Lake in the fields uh, closest to the cemetery. I don't know the name of it. I'm fairly new to the area, but um, yeah, it's been out there just growing wild. And I don't know if anybody's ever touched mullen before, uh, but it it kind of threw me off the first time because I didn't expect it to feel like velvet or like a fabricy material. It was, it was pretty fuzzy and. And that's kind of one of the distinguishing marks. There's another uh, plant similar to it that has that, that feel when, on the leaves there. Um. Yeah. What's one, one cool thing that you can do is you can, um, this time of year, when, when she becomes, once her flowering stalk dries, yeah. you can harvest, you can ask to receive that medicine, and then you can dip in your favorite kind of wax and make mullein candlesticks that then bring the medicine to your home throughout the wintertime. And it helps with respiratory throughout. That's pretty awesome. I did not know that. Thank you. All right. And um, yeah, some of the herbal treatments. I mean, you've uh, if you've had it, it's it's good for respiratory health, congestion from dry cough. Uh, the flower is uh, you know the the flower itself is used for remedy uh, for remedying ear, ear aches as well uh, or ear infections. So. Um, I didn't know that 
everybody ha kind of has a, a bit of a prerequisite or had a bit of knowledge when it comes to herbs and plants around here and definitely uh, I try to make it for everybody uh, next time I'll make it a little bit more robust with information <laughs> I'm learning last year. yeah so hopefully it's just not repetitive for some or not enough there but uh, mugwort um, this is actually one of the first plants I discovered here in, in Oregon and it's like I don't know I fell in love with it with its scent um, it has a very distinguishing uh, distinguished smell to it um, it's they say I mean the information I got to describe it was bittersweet but I mean it just it has a very distinct smell to it um, and uh, I found that most of the places where, where, where I've discovered mugwort is either you know up in the mountains uh, on the hillsides usually rocky areas um, sometimes on the outskirts of like farmland and uh, you know, and that's that's from here to like you know going from from the back roads all the way down out towards uh, Central Point. I found it all over the place there, so it's been pretty cool uh, discovering that. Um, the leaves uh, of the mugwort they have a green upper surface and a white kind of gray hairy underside. Uh, back in the Middle Ages, uh, mugwort was known as mother of herbs, and that's just a little bit of info. Uh, the medicinal properties, uh, obviously mugwort has been used in traditional medicine for a variety of purposes, including digestive issues, irregular menstruum, and uh, high blood pressure, and? Well, yeah. Yeah, just to share that, she was one of my first loves too when it comes to herbalism, and nice. uh, through dream work, and so yes. she helps with yes. dreams, and our Polish ancestors, my, my mom and I share Polish roots, we, mm -hmm. our ancestors would weave wreaths around the summer solstice and throw them into the fire for divination and mm -hmm. the river. That is so awesome. She's a very cool plant. Mm -hmm. I can tell we're going to be friends. Yeah, I want to talk, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to talk too much. I don't want to too much space, so, but I, I love Gotcha. It. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Um, St. John's Wort was the, uh, and they were literally across the street when I discovered the, the mug wart, I found St. John's Wort, and it was growing all up on the hillside there. So, St. John's Wort, uh, you know, can be found, and most of the places I found it uh, is, on, is on old country um, mountain roads. Uh, but I've seen it in the valley, I've seen it uh, like in outskirts, uh, like in the country where there's like fields. Um, but again, where it's kind of rocky and, and ditches and things like that, that's where you can find it. Um, let's see here. Season, uh, it starts uh, to flower around June 24th, which is actually uh, the feast of feast day of St. John. Uh, and that's kind of where it gets its name from, is, you know, St. John's Wort there. Uh, the description, yellow or coppery uh, flowers in about four to five petals, uh, describes, uh, it has a new, like numerous stamens, like so these little starbursts here looking things and uh, a single pistil. Uh, the medicinal properties, uh, St. John is promoted, promoted for depression, menopausal symptoms, attention deficit disorder, uh, somatic symptom disorder, um, and exaggerated anxiety and phys uh, physical symptoms there, obsessive compulsive disorder, and uh, many other mental, uh, uh, yep. It's also good for nerve pain. Mm -hmm. it, it heals nerves, yeah. uh, so you can actually heal a nerve that's exposed in your mouth by um, holding a, um, a dropper full of the tincture ah. <clears throat> in a little bit of water, hold it there for 30 seconds, and that will gradually heal that nerve. Awesome. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I was going to share something similar to that. It actually works better for healing nerves than for emotional things. Um, but what's really cool is the buds when you're making the tincture. Um, you squeeze them between your fingers to know when it's ready to harvest because it looks like um, it looks like blood, mm -hmm. and that's why St. John's Wort is so good for your blood. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it, it's a, a really amazing antiviral um, antibiotic, and um, <clears throat> so you squeeze it, and then also to ID it before you're sure about the buds or the flowers is you take one of the leaves and you lift it up to the yes. sun and you can see it's perforated, you can see the little holes yeah. that are shining through. That's right. um, so there are different ways to ID it before it's even in bloom because you don't want to make medicine um, when it's in flower, mm -hmm. other than for spiritual reasons. Which mm -hmm. And to add on to that, like the lot of names have pericum perforatum, so the perforatum comes from yeah. the, the holes, but also the side effect is 
she puts holes in your skin in terms of UV, so you, you're mindful of what you take internally to, it makes you more sensitive to sun or UV the damage. Oh, gotcha. So like the, the, the holes in the leaves, the darkness in there speaks to how it creates the little holes in you, too. <laughs> nice. I like to drink the tea with psilocybin. Yeah. Last longer. Really? Yeah. It's sort of an MAOI, if I'm not mistaken. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. There are so many people with so much knowledge here. So <laughs> Thank you guys. <laughs> oh man. So lucky tonight. This is the right topic. Yeah. Right topic. I don't know which flowers next time to, to pull up there. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, um, all right. So, oh, I don't know what I just did there. There we go. Uh, Red Clover, uh, if anybody wants to add in, you can definitely do so. <laughs> uh, the location of Red Clover, I mean, pretty much this is a pretty invasive species. It can grow, I mean, most people see it in their yards, yeah. And, uh, you know, it grows all over the place. April to October, typically, uh, you can see it growing out, um, you know, in your front yard. If we need a description for it, Red Clovers uh, are hollow. They have hairy stems and branches. They the, the three leafed leaves, excuse me, that was hard one to say, but, uh, you know, they're clover-shaped, uh, they have like V-shaped markings on them. The flowers are usually rose pink and grow in compact cluster heads. Uh, some of the medicinal properties, and anybody can add to this, uh, red clover is a wild plant that belongs uh, to the legume family. It contains isofla isoflavins, uh, which are com compounds that are similar to the structure of estrogen. Uh, red clover can act as an exp expectorant, uh, which helps clear the lungs and mucus. Red clover can act as a diuretic, which helps with the body to get rid of excess fluid. Uh, it can be eaten in raw in salads um, or dried for tea. So, yeah. Um, anybody seen chicory growing around? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty. It grows pretty wild around here too. A beautiful plant though. Mm -hmm and uh, beautiful flowers in the morning. Um, so yeah, they can be found pretty much everywhere, roadsides, uh, your backyard if you let it overgrow, and, you know, parks and other recreational places there. Uh, seasons between July to September. Let's see here. Uh, the flower, head, uh, flower heads of chicory emerge along the stems, like a light blue-white color. Uh, basil leaves kind of they kind of resemble uh, those of dandelion leaves, so they're, they're you know kind of big there. Uh, the root of the plant can be boiled down uh, after it's been roasted, boiled down, and uh, you can make coffee with it, which seems to be pretty popular now. And uh, you can do that in the winter months. Uh, that's when all the uh, when when the time would be to, to dig it up. Um, Sim, uh, it has a similar fa uh, taste, flavor to coffee, uh, but doesn't have any of the caffeine. So, uh, herbal treatments uh, for, for or, excuse me, the medicinal properties of this uh, could be an herbal treatment for everyday ailments such as uh, tonic for appetite stimulation, and it can help treat with gall uh, treatment with gallstones, gastritis, sinus problems, and uh, cuts and bruises. And again, is another invasive species here. Wild carrot, um, this is another one that grows everywhere. It's like you go, you drive around and you'll see it like just on the roadsides there. Um, those, I mean, they can be found pretty much everywhere in the valley, parks, uh, recreational areas, urban developments, your front yard, your backyard. Uh, and usually between the, the months of July to, to September, uh, wild carrots, they probably grow about, like, I would say about no taller than, well, not too much taller than me. Um, <laughs> and uh, they have hairy stems on them, which is a big, uh, a big distinctive character of them uh, versus uh, hem poison hemlock, which grows a lot around here as well. Yeah. I was just going to say, uh, another name is called Queen Anne's Lace. Yes. And so they said the queen has hairy legs. The queen has hairy legs. That's, <laughs> a, that's a good way to, to remember that there. Um, and their leaves, you know, they're pretty feathery, uh, uh, and they kind of alternate there. Uh, and when you when you rub them together, they smell a little bit like like fresh carrots. Um, so, the medicinal properties uh, traditionally wild carrots have been recognized for their uh, analytic, uh, or I think I said an antalytic, diuretic, 
preminative and uh, antiseptic properties, anti-inflammatory properties as well. Um, I haven't experienced any of those or used them for, for medicine-wise. I just eat them. They're, you know, it's like a wild root. Uh, so you want to dig it up if you do try it. And that's, a, you know, obviously make sure you're identifying it correctly because, like I said, uh, go ahead. Hey, just a quick question about what, what, what does carminative mean? Car carminative? Yes. Yeah. What is antimythic? Yeah, that one? I have to double check. Yeah, I think, stones. I think it's, it's, um, I think it breaks up stones. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. A good way to identify that plant is if you look at the center of the flower, there'll be a different colored flower. In the yeah, like almost a red or red dot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's also, I think, a purgative, so you've got to be careful with mm -hmm. eating it. Mm -hmm. what? The root, I think it's a purgative, pretty strong mm -hmm. purgative. Huh. Yep. All right. And uh, so I'm just going to read off a few of these here um, that are toxinous, toxic and poisonous plants there. <coughs> Poison hemlock, like I just said. I, I kind of, I'm getting towards the end of this here, so I appreciate you guys for sitting tight. Um, these can all be found, I mean, these can be found everywhere around the valley. They grow pretty invasively uh, between the months of June to September. Uh, the stems are hollow, hairless. Uh, they have these, these ridges uh, and, um, and the, the stem or the, yeah, the stalks of them have these purple spots on them. And that's a big indicator. They have like a, like a powdery coat to them. And all of this plant is toxic. None of it is edible or medicinal. <coughs> um, you know, if you get it on your skin, it can cause dermatitis for some people. Uh, ingesting it, I mean, it's pretty, uh, pretty quick way to go to the ER. So, or maybe somewhere else beyond. <laughs> uh, another one is water hemlock, which grows pretty much by the water side. I, I, didn't really have much of a description because it's pretty much this, it's very similar in look. Um, and like I said, it can, fool, it, it can definitely resemble wild carrot or Queen Anne's lace, but it, it is not something you want to eat. It's and, like carrots. Yeah, there you go. And so, uh, invasive, and I just threw this one in here just to, because I, like I said, I did want to put in a whole lot of, um, a lot of other plants that grow here, but I just didn't know how much time it would take and this is my first time getting in front of people, so. Uh, so yeah, so the snowberry, um, I've only found these around like the parks, uh, like Bear Creek. Uh, I don't think I've seen any in Ashland and Lithia or anything like that, but I, I uh, yeah? I was just, I mean, but I was just gonna say that um, the indigenous peoples, and now I'm learning from that tradition, is like you can work with this berry topically as like a, like a, like a nat nature's hand sanitizer. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. But yeah, not internally. Yeah. <laughs> not, no. Um, it'll definitely clean you out. <laughs> 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 so, um, so snowberries, like I said, they're, they're also another poisonous plant here. And that's pretty much, uh, that's, that's it for the presentation or the lecture part. Now we get to the Q&A, so. Did the hemlock, does it make a carrot-like structure too, or is it just similar oh. looking? Uh, no, it does not make a carrot-like structure. You're talking like in regards in roots, to the roots, yeah. 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 Um, but, I mean, it's it, uh, it's pretty distinct because it'll grow taller than most of like the other plants. Like, I don't know if you've seen by the, like on the freeway or anything, there's those big, tall, stocky plants. And, oh. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, anybody else have any questions? Yes. Yeah, you you use the term invasive, and I am not anybody who like understands this. So, invasive to me always meant negative, but you're using it both for the, the poisonous ones and then the ones that are really beneficial. So, and invasive can be both positive and negative. Invasive, uh, like, so I'm using it for for for, for I guess from my own. Uh, perspective of the word, right? So uh, I think of invasive being like this plant that overgrows everywhere. So it's not necessarily positive or negative. It's um, just being used as a, a descriptive word of like this, you know, a plant that just pretty much, uh, you know, grows and is also classified by, you know, from, I guess, from the internet, from what I've read. Uh, 
in the state of Oregon as it's classified as invasive. So a, a plant, uh, <coughs> yeah, that's kind of over overgrown the area. Okay. Yeah. Did that help? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. I think blackberries would be a really good description for those because they're good. Everybody loves them. Oh yeah, they'll take over everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. pushed out native plants. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why they're invasive. Mm -hmm. They'll take yeah. over everything. They definitely grow a lot of places around here. I had one one um, in my backyard one year, and it started off as just a little, you know, maybe that size little bush, and within a year, it was all the way down the fence. So. Yeah, they grow pretty fast. Um, but yeah, so any other questions? Oh, there we are. I'm sorry. Where, where is your shop? Yeah. So my shop, so I did say it's in Ashland. However, it's an uh, online uh, store for now. I'm working very hard to, uh, to put together, to get a brick and mortar. That's exciting. Okay. Yeah. And so I actually, I'll be showcasing some of the, uh, some of the products uh, at the, the Miwi Festival, I think it is, or the there's a there's a festival coming up, um, or fair, uh, at the Lithia Ashland Springs Hotel this weekend, oh, and wow. it's uh, metaphysical, and, and yeah, a metaphysical uh, kind of fair that's going on. So, okay. I think uh, I didn't, don't remember if it's I'll have to double check, and if you leave me your information, I could send you an email with the flyer, but. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's going to be pretty awesome. I went last year as a uh, just you know as a spectator, and so this year I'm going to come back and yes. Can you put it on the meetup site? Yeah. Um, heck yeah. Heck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so this is all my information here. Oh. And so so that's pretty much it. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed this. I enjoyed you guys' company.